engagement and leadership positions at the university level, as well as the numerous articles and lecture notes that he puts online for both the technical and, and, and lay leader. Lay leader. And today he's going to tell us about the one doctor. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just smiling, knowing Mo as a grad student, when he was a grad student, and seeing you as what was called the Boston place. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's very warm seeing you as the, the postdoc. Um, all right, so um, I'll be talking about a spin one dark sector. It'll be a model talk. Um, the more interesting thing is why we might care. So here's a spoiler. The why we might care is not actually the spin one dark matter. But guess what? It's my talk, so we end up talking about the spin one dark matter. Um, this is work with my student, Ian Chafee. Um, so right now, this is Team Flint at UCR. And since James and I were talking about graphical table of contents, here is the plan. Um, I will give a quick summary of the light mediator scenario. So it's following up from the Sam Houston talk. Um, we'll spend most of our time talking about this particular model of spin one dark matter. We'll talk about this guy there. Um, and then, so after spending most of my time talking about this very specific model, um, I'll make a couple of tangential comments about related things that are not obviously related. Um, and we'll figure out what the chalk point stands for. Okay, so our launching point is this idea of the WIMP, which is now maybe ancient history. This idea that one of our favorite dark matter candidates was something that was weakly coupled, where weak means electroweak. And we had a roadmap for how to look for this dark matter. If dark matter interacts with a weak force, it has something to do with the case boson, it interacts with a standard model in a way that we can roughly figure out what's in this block. Z bosons, Higgs's, whatever it may be. You roughly have pairs of dark matter with pairs of standard model because of gauge invariance on the standard model side, and usually some kind of parity to prevent the dark matter from decaying on the dark matter side. So once you have this blob, you can get the correct relic abundance. This is the WIMP miracle, the idea that you're within an order of magnitude or two of the correct observed relic abundance. That's nice. But you also automatically get um, prescriptions for how to look for dark matter. And right now, our direct detection constraints are really suffocating our maybe our 1990s preferred parameter space for the WIMP. So one possible way forward you can debate whether or not it's motivated, um, but one possible way forward is to do the very trivial release valve. Maybe dark matter talks to ordinary matter through an intermediary. If the intermediary is heavy, well, it might as well not be there. You integrate it out. If the mediator is light, well, then something either interesting or trivial, depending on which way you're looking at it, happens. The mediator talks to the dark matter with some interaction string, which I'll call green. The mediator talks to ordinary matter with some interaction strength, which I'll call red. And the annihilation of dark matter, which is what we needed to get the correct abundance, only depends on the green coupling. So if I wanted to be very minimal, I can set the green coupling to be whatever it needs to be to get the right amount of dark matter. It's just like the wind in that sense. The typical searches for dark matter, the things that we knew we should be doing for the, neutral, the neutralino, depend on the red coupling. And because we can dial down the red coupling, we can now dial down these interactions. OK, so that sounds really trivial. I had something that didn't quite work, so I threw in more parameters. And with more parameters, it gives you more freedom. So why should we be surprised? Why should we be happy about this? Who motivated this anyway? So one nice motivation is not so much that I have any deep religious belief in the idea that there is a light mediator. But I do have a belief that we should be looking for dark matter in ways that are beyond what we had prescribed in the 1990s. And what this simple framework tries us is a new way to look for the dark sector. So, okay, we still get annihilation. Direct detection is more or less the same, only we have a different particle running through the middle. But rather than looking for missing energy at colliders, you can look for the effect of a new light particle, so new forces, um, connecting standard model curves. Or more interestingly, or if you're from Riverside, more interesting, um, self-interactions. 
the interactions of dark matter to itself through the mediator is a new thing that comes up in this simple scenario. And to leading order, you might think, why would dark matter self-interact with matter if we can't see dark matter? But this ends up giving you energy transfer. And so we are, of course, living in a bubble of dark matter, our dark matter halo. And if we have a way for dark matter to transfer energy, you change the density profile of that halo. And this is now something that you can observe. And depending on how dogmatic you want to be or how, how religiously you want to believe in what my colleagues say about dark matter, there may even be evidence for this. But at the very least, this is a handle to look for properties of a dark sector. So the, the buzzword is dark sector for dark matter plus new forces that couple to the standard model. Um, so dark matter plus medium. Luke, can I ask a question? Yes. So all the way on the left, so I, I, I get how your green brain is co-annihilating and handling relic bodies here. But for indirect detection, these these mediators are still, you know, okay. still presumably, you know, if you're really calling it indirect detection on Fermi, then you've still got red, right? It's, ah, good. So, so yes. Because so there's supposed to be some kinetic there, mixing. There, with there will be a red vertex here. To, to turn it into kinetic mixing with them. But the rate for this to happen yeah. doesn't depend on that because for, it's the, for the relic abundance, you're still going. Yes. For indirect detection, you're also still going. For, for, for indirect detection, yeah. Because we're in, we're I'm assuming it. that this thing doesn't. Because it's only decay as if it's kind of all along the way. Yeah. Ah. You get some branching ratio. It may be ratio. slow, but it's 100%. Exactly. Perfect. And Thank it's you. usually on indirect detection scales. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Thank Good. you. Okie doke. So here is the, the honest presentation of what this talk is. What I want to present is a toy model of dark matter that is spin one. Why spin one? Um, well, the honest reason is because I wasn't sure if my grad student understood the symmetry structure of the standard model. So this was the project that we, we decided to do. What's kind of neat is that it has a light mediator. So this is building a dark sector using a spin one dark matter part. So okay, this is, I claim, a new model, newish. Um, does this model populate a fantastic new phenomenon? No, certainly not in this talk. Am I going to show you cool new exclusion plots? No, unfortunately not. Is the model a particularly elegant model? No, it's not even technically natural. But maybe at the very end, I will motivate why I think it's a cute model and why it's a useful thing to have in one's pocket while thinking about uh, other, perhaps more interesting, new exotic directions. In fact, even so, this, this is what the model looks like, and, and most of this talk will be motivating why we have this spectrum. So here is the dark matter, suggestively named W. Here is the mediator, suggestively named A, for a dark photon. And then there are these other states. Why are these other states there? That's what we're going to talk about. Um, the extent to which this is new is subject to these caveats. So vector dark matter is not an old, a new idea. In fact, it goes at least all the way back to the earliest KK dark matter models. That's James. Um, one way to think about where this vector dark matter model sits um, in terms of recent papers, uh, so the UC Irvine group, so Kim at the time was, was in Southern California, Kim Body, um, studied what happens if we have vector dark matter that confines. So this is what they call blue ball dark matter. And then it thought about self interactions. This model is kind of the same idea, but in a different phase. Rather than the confining phase, we're in a Higgs phase. And now you start thinking about why that spectrum had to look the way it did. Okay, so that was my motivation for why are we talking about this very odd model. And now let's just start picking apart how do we build this model. Okay, now this is subtable of contents, and so I should put words. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is talk about the symmetry structure. So we're going to do one pass just talking about symmetry and symmetry breaking. Then we're going to write down a Lagrangian. And since Lagrangians are tedious, the fact that you already know the symmetry structure should, should make things a little bit smoother. And then I will give the smallest hint of phenomenology. Okay. So what do we want? We want spin one dark matter. Okay. I could have taken a gauge, multi a gauge boson, U1, SU2, SU3, whatever. How do we pick which one? I want it to be simple. Okay, U1. I would also like to have a mediator. Okay, we could have a scalar mediator. Okay, people don't know. Maybe I want to have a vector mediator. 
So vector dark matter, which is presumably heavy, with a vector mediator. That means this vector needs to talk to this vector. Well, I know how to make vectors talk to each other. They're all part of the same multiplet. So maybe I should have SU2, SU2 vector, let's call it, and have a gauge group where I have three gauge bosons that talk to each other. OK, I have the interactions for G, and it all comes through. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to be using Ws, Hs, all the usual letters from the standard model. This is not the standard model. Most of this talk is completely in the dark sector. But W is a useful, a useful letter because we, we know what the vertices look like. Okay, so without doing anything, just saying that, and having had your particle physics one graduate course, you could write down this model. I have a gauge symmetry SU2, and I throw in some kind of field to break the symmetry, right? Because without any symmetry breaking, these are all massless and degenerate. I want to have a mass hierarchy. So I can get a mass hierarchy by breaking the symmetry. How should I break the symmetry? Well, I can break it with a doublet like the Higgs, or maybe a triplet. So phi is a triplet. Maybe I should break this down. So phi is equal to, I'm going to use the representation um, 1 half sigma 3 times the order parameter f. Phi is a triplet. And the triplet breaks SU2, so this is the global symmetry of phi to U1. If I gauge that symmetry, I am breaking SU2 gauge to U1 gauge. So I have a leftover unbroken symmetry generated by T3, so I have a photon that talks to two charged vectors, the W bosons. Right, so this is just like the lecture read, but simpler. This thing, of course, is massless because you still have an unbroken gauge symmetry. Um, and we even know what happens to the longitudinal modes. These things become massive by eating the Goldstone modes. So how do I determine the Goldstone modes? Well, I take the field, the linear field that breaks the symmetry, plug in the VEV, I can go to the minimum of the potential, and I shift the VEV, call that shift a field, promote it to a field, and those are the Goldstones. So, uh, bar phi, <laughs> bar phi sub phi, these charged guys are things that are eaten by the W boson to get longitudinal polarizations. Okay. This, I, I think this is even a, a problem in Tim's QFT class. Like this, this model. Mm -hmm. this, it's the old standard model that broke down the Z. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, yeah, good. So this is something that we all, and, and this is why you can imagine me giving this to a graduate student. Okay, so that's pretty good, but a massless dark photon is not what I want. I want something massive in part because I want this thing to decay in standard mode. So that should be easy. Okay, so so I just need to give, I need to feed this thing some gold stuff. I just need to break more symmetry. Break more symmetry. There's this U1 left over that U1 generates the dark photon. I need to break that and give a goldstone mode for that dark photon to eat. Easy. I know how to break uh, stuff to, to nothing, uh, SU2 to nothing. I introduce another field, H, suggestively named, a doublet. This thing, this thing gets about 1 over 2, 0 V, suggestively like my standard model. Once I put in a new field H, so there's an SU2 global for the phi, there's an SU2 global for the H, and I'm going to gauge the vector combination. If I transform phi and I transform H by the same transformation, that is the thing that is gauged. And when this thing gets a VEV, when this thing gets a VEV, it breaks this global symmetry to nothing. So this guy now has three Goldstone bosons. Right? And this is basically e to the i Goldstone dot generator over over v over v <coughs> acting on each side. That was what was missing on the slide. So these bar phi's here are exactly these bar phi's. Since I'm breaking SU2 to nothing, I have three Goldstones. So one of them is neutral, which is precisely what the photon needs, and it goes from zero mass to some small mass. Assuming it, assuming that. 
this order parameter is much smaller than this order parameter. Cool. If we were just playing around and building dark sector models, what is the first thing? What is the first thing that you worry about? Right? The, if I was building a dark matter model, this model is nice and simple. You're done. Right? The dark matter is stable because it's charged. It's charged under an unbroken U1. Now I say I want to have, oh, let me have a, a more flexible dark sector model. I want the meteor to be massive. Now I'm breaking that U1. I have no more leftover gauge symmetry. What is protecting my W from decaying? And in fact, it looks really bad because the Ws have lots of things to decay into. And in fact, on the note of having lots of things to decay into, not only do I have this mediator, I also have a bunch of massless goldstones that are floating around. Okay, so this was one thing that, that sometimes is a little bit subtle. Because one might argue, wait, how many symmetries do you have to break? Right? I thought we just had an SU2. And it's true, we only had an SU2 gauge, but this is exactly a parallel of the standard model. So here is the analogous thing for the standard model. The standard model is a little bit more complicated because you have hypercharge. But you have two sources of electroid symmetry breaking in the standard model. Right? You have the Higgs, 125 GeV. It's a doublet that does something like this. And it breaks electroweak to electromagnetism. But you also have the chiral condensate in QCD. Right? You have something technicolor-like. It's really backwards when you say technicolor-like. You have the thing which inspired technicolor. The thing which actually happens in QCD. It gets a VEV, and that breaks this flavor symmetry to the vector combination. Now, these SE2 lefts are in principle different things. This is a global symmetry acting on the Higgs. This is a global symmetry acting on the chiral condensate. But I gauge the vector combination. And what happens is, we know that the Higgs gives us the radio mode and these goldstones that are, are, are equal. This thing happens at, what, 100 MeV-ish? This ends up giving a small contribution to the W mass. Right? When this happens, you also have three goldstone bosons. I'm going to suggestively call them pi, because they are the pions. The pions that we know are very light. And some combination of these pions are eaten by these gauge bosons to give them a small contribution to the mass. And some, so some people say that, that uh, electroid symmetry is broken twice. There are two order parameters, or a combination of two, two sources of symmetry breaking. There are two different, these two different order parameters give you two sets of goldstones. So these goldstones are mostly all eaten. These goldstones are mostly not eaten. And the fact that we actually have 130 HG, uh, MeV pions is the leftover goldstones here with a very small mixture of these. So this is the structure that we're going to copy. So is there any, any questions, concerns about this? So what are the masses of your new particles? Yeah, I'm trying to be agnostic. But Because pion kind of decays. Oh, good, yeah. So, so, so here, this is literally the standard model. So we know this is 100 GeV and this is 100 MeV. So in, in mine, um, I'm going to leave parameters, so I'm, there'll be a, a capital F, so one order parameter F, that's going to be much bigger, oh shoot, sorry, that'll be much bigger than this order parameter V. In my heart, I'm thinking 100 GeV for the mass of this thing and 10 MeV for this thing, and the only reason why that's in my heart is because high is in my heart, and those are high favorite parameters for self-contracting dark matter. But for this talk, the numbers are not important. Only this hierarchy. So just, uh, one more question. So this file somehow uh, found this uh, SU2 gate, the new SU2 gate. Wouldn't this SU2 gate eventually find the electronic sector and then the gate? So, so good, 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 good. So are you talking about in the standard model or in, on this or model? In, in this new model? So in this model, I, I'm not going to say anything about connecting to the standard model, except for maybe the last slide. So here. What you see is what you get. Then you are more worried about the protection of this, uh, like the W1. The W? Yes. So okay. Good. So the stability would be a concern. I agree. I agree. 
Okay, so this is the standard model. Okay, let, let's, let's say it again in a slightly more fancy way. This is the one thing I've learned from teaching undergrads. <laughs> Just say it over in, in gradual layers of sophistication. This is the global symmetry. The global symmetry is I, can, I have a field phi that has an SE2 global symmetry before I put in any interactions. I have a field H that has an SE2 global symmetry. This is how they transform. Right? There's some SU2 matrix U, SU2 matrix U sub H. There's also a U1 in H. Because in fact, phi has a U2 symmetry. Right? It has a phase. I can, I can transform by sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, or just an overall phase to the dark. It's a complex field. It's, it's actually a U2 flavor symmetry if you want. This is important. Now, the thing which is gauged is, so I gauge corresponds to U5 equals UH. This is what I call the vector, sorry, I wrote up here, the vector supplement, where both of these transform by the same amount. That means, for example, I can write down terms like H dagger phi H. This obeys the gauged symmetry. Is there a reason that you don't want that doublet to be real? Um, the doublet is a complex representation. It's a pseudo real representation of your SU2, right? Fair enough. I need to think about the implications for that. So I'm, I'm, I don't know what they are either. But. I'm, yeah, I'm going to, to use this, and if there's a hole in this, you, you can puncture my balloon shortly. <laughs> Good. Uh, I had not thought about that. Okay. This is just what's on the chalkboard. Um, how are these symmetries broken? This global symmetry is broken by this VEV, and both of these symmetries are broken by this VEV. And of course, there's the potential to give these things VEVs, so it looks like all of this is broken. Now, the symmetries are always at the, at the algebra level, so another way to write this is to write it in terms of the axial, the vector, and this U1 phase. Right? So the, the axial axial is U5 equals U H dagger. So between the two of these is the basis for SU2 plus SU2. This yellow thing is gauged. And when you do this breaking, so you're breaking this guy. This thing is unbroken. This thing is broken. But there is a combination that is left unbroken. I'm going to call it U1 H prime because I ran out of letters. And this is the idea that there is a U1 symmetry that is left over that is global. This Higgs VEV was the thing that broke the U1 gauge symmetry. It has charge plus one half on this component, but that's zero, minus one half on the thing that gets the VEV. This thing, this rephasing, gives me another direction. So if I transform by this guy, so I, I rotate this by some phase, it multiplied by minus one half. Then do a phase rotation under this guy with a one half here. Then the VEV is not transformed. So this is a good leftover symmetry in the theory. This U1H in the standard model is just hypercharged. And it, in the standard model, it is gauged. In this case, it is global. And this is what stabilizes the dark matter. There is a global symmetry that is left over that, that is preserved by the theory. Now, if you want to look at this more operationally, what happens? I have a W, which has charge plus one under this U1, which is broken. So before we do this, my concern is this is charge plus one, but that charge is, is broken, that U1 is broken. But it's broken precisely by, by this VEV. The order parameter for that U1 breaking is the Higgs. Right? The phi doesn't break that U1, only the Higgs does. Okay? So any diagram where this W decays into lighter stuff needs to have that order parameter as a VEV, as an insertion. But 
the VEV has charge one half. So in order, so, so I can write these vacuum insertions as, as spurions for the symmetry breaking, but the spurion has fractional charge. So I need to have, for W plus, an H star and an H star. But there is no way to write down a, a SU2 vector invariant term that couples the W plus with an H star and an H star. You can do it with an H star and an H, but then you're not soaking up the, the broken charge. So this, this is the Spurion way of seeing that this W is in fact still stable, and that this leftover symmetry is doing its job. So this, this I think, was the, the main the main observation. That, oh yeah, you can you can still break that 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 symmetry to nothing. You can still have a mediator with non-zero mass, and still have the vector dark matter with no additional bells and whistles to keep it stable. And it really, really is just hypercharge in the electroweak sector. The have one hypercharge. So if this thing had been real, then I would have to be getting lucky with G parity. Yeah, I think. I think is this secretly G parity and you've promoted it to be a bigger group, I guess is my question. That is something, I, yeah, I don't know the answer. I need to think about that. Yeah, I don't know how to think about the pseudo real perspective. Because there do exist models based on this two breaking that say the Ws are stable because G parity. Yeah, and I would be happy with a discrete subgroup. Okay. So, so it may end up being that. Um, I need to think about whether whether that is secretly what's happening because H should not be thought of in the process. It might be the fact that it's pseudo real, not actually real. Good. Any other questions? I think this this is the this is the most subtle point. From here on out, the points become more straightforward, just up here. There are no <clears throat> there are no virtual processes for decay. That's right. So so um, you can put in whatever light stuff down here, but it's a statement that there is no way to write down any diagrams from symmetry principles. So there's, you have one order parameter for the breaking of this charge, and because this order parameter comes with charge minus one half, or minus one, right, one half, you can't write down, you cannot write down um, h squared w in a way that that is uh, invariant on this SU2B. You can dress with whatever else you want, but you can't have an operator um, that soaks up that charge. Okay. So now I think that's the main symmetry observation. And we just let it roll. Let's see where we go. What, what happens to these guys? Um, we know that the W's mostly eat these gold stones, a little bit of these gold stones. The photon eats the neutral part of the Higgs, the neutral gold stone. And they still have these leftover pesky light modes. Now, at this level, what is the mass? So I have some goldstones are eaten, some goldstones are not. The goldstones that are not eaten are honest to goodness goldstones, meaning they are massless. And I don't like having massless particles around in my simplified model. So, I would like to give a mass to those massless goldstones, make them pseudo goldstones. And what I'm going to do is take this symmetry, so U1 axial is a global symmetry in my theory. U1 axial is, I do a transformation on the phi that is the conjugate of the transformation on the h. And I will just write down a term, this term, and say, I am going to write that term now. Right, that term is invariant under the gauge symmetry, so there's no reason why I can't write it down, but I am just completely destroying this global symmetry. There is a dimensionful parameter mu that one gets to pick. So this is partly where the, this is not a beautiful theory. There is a dimensionful parameter. And we are going to choose that, uh, we're going to pick that mu judiciously. 
So this, again, is completely analogous to the standard model. Our pions are not massless. Our pions have mass 100-ish MeV. Why do these pions have mass 100-ish MeV? Because that leftover symmetry, this analog of SU2 axial, is explicitly broken. It is explicitly broken by the masses of the quarks, or alternatively, from the Yukawa couplings, which, which do not respect SU2, this SU2 lap cross SU2 right symmetry on the flavor symmetry on the quarks. So this is all, this is why this was secretly a test for my student. Do you understand the standard model? OK. So that is the symmetry structure. Okay, now, now we can have the philosophy. We take a deep breath. We write down Lagrangian terms, and we see how do we have to bend ourselves to make this thing plausible. And we start, the, the, the key kernel here is a potential that breaks symmetry. So here is the phi field. This picks out one component. I take this thing minus some f naught parameter squared, quantity squared. This is a potential that looks like a Mexican hat. The minimum is at f naught. Exact same thing here. This is just like the Higgs potential. Um, this has a minimum at h equals u. The factors of two are, of course, compensating for these stupid normalizations. One thing to notice is that what we end up wanting is a big VEV for phi and a small VEV for h. And of course, you know that when, when we write down these transformations, um, it's always divided by the order parameter. The reason why you're dividing by the order parameter is if you want to have a unit normalized Wolfstone boson. So if this is a big circle, one unit in theta is a much bigger shift in the field space than for a small circle. OK, so, so that's, it's easy to get the signature breaking. Now let's write down the most general or normalizable potential to see what our actual parameters are. Here it is. So the kinetic term for the gauge bosons for free. Kinetic term for our two scalings that we've been talking about. Those come for free. And a potential, where the first two terms exist solely to give you the minimum. We have this mu term, which is the term that we put in to explicitly break the leftover symmetry to give mass to the pions. And then we have this additional term left over. And that's it. Any other terms, I think there's, you can write, you can try to finagle a term using phi and h um, by using group theory relations, it ends up being this term again. Okay. So the part that is a textbook turning through the theory, the kinetic terms for the scalars, when you put in the vets, so you expand out the covariant derivatives, right? This is a in this um, representation, you get commutators. Plug in the VEVs, you turn through it. Um, you get the mass terms. And indeed, the mass of the dark matter goes like the heavy scale by design. The mass of the mediator goes like the light scale by design times a coupling g squared. Okay. In order for a gauge boson to get mass, it has to eat a goldstone. So right from the kinetic terms, let's just churn through it. Um, by expanding the fields about the Goldstone directions, or this is the fancy phrase for this is for the Coleman, Cowan, West Domino parameterization, you get these terms to leading order. So this is a mixing between the W and this linear combination of the Goldstone fields. If you want to normalize it properly, you get the stupid square root. For the photon, it's really easy because there was only one field breaking that symmetry, so there's only one goldstone, and it's really easy to write that down. And then, okay, so here is a linear combination that's eaten by the W. The orthogonal combination is the pion. Right, so all I did here was I took this thing, and I wrote down the orthogonal combination in field space. And there's something a little bit funny about this. Um, 
it bothered me, and I, I think it shouldn't bother you because in retrospect it's obvious, but it's kind of funny that, that well, it makes sense here that the goldstone, the thing that is eaten by the gauge bosons, it's going to be mostly the five. It's going to be mostly this thing, because this is the bigger source of symmetry breaking. If I take the, the V goes to zero limit, this should be the only source of symmetry breaking. But if I didn't gauge anything, SU2 vector and SU2 axial are two perfectly good directions until I explicitly break. Right? Up to this level, there's no difference between SU2 vector and SU2 axial. It's just the which direction is one thing going versus the other. Why does this thing know about the big mev? It's mostly the thing with the big mev. And why is this thing mostly the thing with the small mev? How did that, there's kind of an asymmetry there. And What's happening here is, so here's Goldstone space. Right, so what's happening, this is, let me draw this. I have one big symmetry direction, symmetry breaking direction, and this is F, I think it's F, uh, I'll call it FA, which is what we call F. And then there is a small symmetry breaking direction, which I think in the plus called FB, which is what I call B. So in Goldstone space, the vector Goldstone is along this direction, and the axial Goldstone is not orthogonal to it. And you could have picked either one. The fact that I am gauging one or the other, and if they're totally equivalent, if I choose to gauge the vector one, means I have a mode in this direction, because the mass term, the mixing term in the, in the kinetic term, told me this is, a, this is a thing mixing with a W. And then I was forced to take the orthogonal combination, right? I have to orthonormalize, and I get this thing. If I gauge the axial combination, I get this, and I'd be forced to take this combination. So I don't know, that was, that was a curiosity for me. But that's how you get what the Goldstone, the Eaton Goldstone direction is, and this is what the Pion direction is. So where are we? I have the doublet and I have the triplet. I now know which combinations of these, these charged goldstones are being eaten by the dark matter, by the heavy vector. The combination that goes into the light mediator is easy. And I also know which combination of these go to the pion, which is still massless, and we don't like that. So. The one thing we do is, well, the next thing we do is we actually put in the explicit breaking term. This explicit breaking term transforms under an axial transformation, right, where u phi is u h dagger, and therefore gives a mass to those goldstones, to the, to the pi on. Right, it's invariant under the gauge thing, which is good, it had to be, not under this thing. And you end up with a pi on mass, which is proportional to the symmetry breaking parameter. Okay. Let me just give you a picture of what's going on. Um, the actual potential is a two-dimensional plot, as a three-dimensional plot, right? So what I'm plotting here is um, this, this is F and this is V, and I'm plotting what the potential looks like. in the 5F versus the HF, and these are contours. So here's one plot for a small mu, and the minima are here. As I increase mu, I start stretching these out. Right? The features here are you have two symmetric minima of V, and that's because the potential is completely symmetric in H. You can take H to minus H, and you get the same thing. But the mu term, well, without the mu term, it's also symmetric enough. The mu term, though, is linear enough, and so it biases the potential uh, in this direction to small to negative f, or in this direction. Okay. So, in other words, every term in this potential is separately invariant under SU2 V cross SU2 
So SC2, V cross SC2A. So I can rephase all my fields, and the gold stones don't show up anywhere in any of these terms. They reappear in the kinetic terms, and you have the nonlinear signal model, pions with derivative interactions. This is the one term where you have explicit breaking, and the pions pick up direct couplings to other fields and masses. And so what you end up with, so again, here's a doublet, here's a triplet. Dark matter and the mediator, each one combination. The other combination now has a mass that I get to pick based on what mu is. And I get to push this up or down. And along the way, the radial loads also end up getting a small shift in their masses because the mu term causes the H radial load to mix with the phi radial load. I don't care too much about that, but as a sanity check, you should have already guessed that they would have separated in this direction because of level splitting. Anytime we have a symmetric matrix, it, the eigenvalues want to go this way. And that's basically it. Now we just stop and think, what do we actually want from this model? Um, and the one thing left to say is, well, by construction, I wanted g squared b squared, which is the mass of this thing, to be much lighter than g squared s squared, which is the mass of dark matter. This is the light mediator phenomenology that I wanted, so I'm putting this by hand. And the one extra thing is, I want this to be lighter than this. And the only dumb reason for that is because if this were lighter than this, then this would decay into the pi hat. This, this is just me saying, actually, I really, really, really wanted the vector dark matter. But even now, since pi hat decays to lighter particles, so, so, so this is the this is a dark pi hat. And the, the U1 symmetry is, is, is still active. Okay, let's let's talk about dirty secrets. So here's the potential again. You would think that V naught should be roughly you know, the scale of V. F naught is roughly the scale of F. So if I take the potential and minimize it, or I, I take the first derivative, so I find critical points, you get these conditions. So the physical VEV is like, the, the VEV I put in plus some small perturbation. And because I want V to be much smaller than that, yeah, it's a small perturbation. But here, the physical VEV is equal to this parameter plus something which is very big. And in fact, if I want this thing to be small compared to F squared, then V naught squared, some number that I put in here, has to be large and negative and tuned against this thing. So this is full disclosure, this is absolutely tuned. I have nothing to make that, to put sugar in that, in that medicine. That's, that, is, that is what you have to do to make this model work. That, that's the cost of, of putting in this hierarchy by hand. Well, you have to go and read some things by Marcus Lutie. He'll tell you that this is induced electroweak symmetry. Right? This is yeah, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That this is a plus sign effectively. It doesn't look like there's a VEV. And this trilinear is taking this VEV and, and putting it into the, the Higgs. Exactly. See, it's a beautiful model. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'll take that comment. <laughs> I don't know if I buy it. <laughs> um, and then one small thing is, is this also gives you this level splitting. Here's the mass matrix. This is something that, that one can do underground quantum mechanics. <laughs> There's one more term, and just to say this term doesn't actually do much. Right? This, it gives you interactions between the, the, the radial modes, um, and it contributes a bit to the level splitting to make it asymmetric, um, but it does not qualitatively change the structure of the theory. Okay, so there was a very arbitrary but semi thought out model for, for dark matter. Let me say a few things about phenomenology. And by construction, so this is why this is, this is kind of a, a doubter. Um, this is by construction something that maps onto a simplified model. So you can take all your dark photon phenomenology, take your favorite review articles, take James's, and plug it in there. So you, get, you get a few order one factors coming from the fact that it's spin one. Um, but the two things to point out are self-interactions and the portal interactions. So I'll say that very quickly. 
Why is this nice? It, so part of the, the reason for doing this was my next door neighbor, Hyvo Yu, is a big proponent of self-interacting dark matter. And at some point he said, you know, I really don't think you can have vector self-interacting dark matter because of this thing about the mediator. In order to have self-interacting dark matter, you need to have a massive mediator. The reason for that is this is a plot, right? This is a plot for targets for um, the distribution of dark matter, uh, the, the profile distribution of dark matter in a halo. The dots, so this is on the x-axis is the velocity of the characteristic system, the velocity of dark matter, dark matter scattering. The y-axis is a transfer cross-section. And these are observations of dwarf galaxies, low surface brightness, um, and clusters. Forget the end body, this is a simulation of the constant cross-section. Um, and Hybo's big, big uh, belief is a dark matter particle with a velocity-dependent um, transfer cross-section can hit all of these bounds and explain observations in these systems. It was critical that there's a hierarchy of about a thousand in the dark matter mass and the mediator mass. So why would you run through this regular world, building this model and, and putting in the mass for the dark photon? Oh, now you can hit this target that you could not have done in the first slide model for the massless photon. So all of this so far has just been in the dark sector. Now we can talk about how does this thing talk to the standard model. The thing which is so obvious that it's already been done is you couple the thing that we're calling H and phi to the standard model Higgs. So that's something that's been, been studied. And this is, in fact, if you want from a naive dimensional analysis, this should be the leading operator. But one thing that you get that's kind of neat about this is you also get kinetic mixing with a massive dark photon. So here you have, by putting in the order parameter for SU2 breaking to U1, this is a mixing of the dark photon, because this projects out the T3, with hypercharge. This is precisely the, the dark photon of my model. If you want to invent a new field that is heavy, that couples uh, the two SU2s, this is a like twin Higgs model, um, then you can get Z-mixing. Once you have picked your poison for how you talk to the standard model, you can go to James's review and then figure out how this thing actually talks to, um, how this thing interacts with scattering. So one thing which is actually kind of neat is if you really only have the vector mediator, then there's no spin independent cross section. There's a there's suppression from, from direct search experiments, that's, which is something kind of neat. It's not a new suppression, this suppression is, that's been well thought out. But in this model, you always had the light Higgs not too far away. So you always still get a Higgs mediator uh, talking to you. Why do you always have a light Higgs? Uh, because you have the interaction, I think I was calling it lambda prime, H squared minus D naught squared squared. Oh, this is not the right calculator. Sorry, this, the mass of the light mediator is down to minus. But this, this is the term giving you a mass for the, the light Higgs. And by perturbativity, you don't want lambda to be bigger than 4 pi. So you really can't decouple the scalar mediator. OK, so, so I thought you had something really neat to say here, but it turns out um, you're stuck with this guy. OK, so, so that's, that, that is the model. Let me take five minutes and say why I think this toy model, which we have laboriously gone through, um, it's actually something cute to play with for more exotic ideas. So now for something completely different, but not actually completely different. Something motivated. We bend over backwards to set mu, an arbitrary parameter, to make this thing heavy. What if mu weren't that big? Then this thing would be dark matter. Now I have goldstone and dark matter. Okay, this is not a, also not a new thing. And maybe I just forget about the A and Mills part. I don't, don't care about these guys. This is now a theory of um, Goldstone bosons in the dark sector. Well, if I'm forgetting about this, maybe the Goldstone bosons are themselves the mediator. And this is now something which is a little bit more interesting. Because Goldstone bosons, as mediators, really fit in naturally with the idea of a composite Higgs. The composite Higgs is this idea that the Higgs is light because maybe it's kind of a Goldstone boson. Now, I can have a Goldstone boson talking to other Goldstone bosons if it's part of the same multiple from symmetry breaking. 
And one way of getting a composite Higgs model is SL6 to SL5. This is the, the next minimal composite Higgs. Why is that interesting? Well, SL6 um, has an SL4 symmetry. SL4 is SU2 cross SU2. Hey, this is pattern that we just saw in our toy model. Now, for the Sam Houston guys, this is me being a complete hypocrite. Because now I am talking about connecting dark sectors to the naturalness of the Higgs, which is why I said yesterday is not something that's maybe worth doing anymore. And I fully own up to that. And let me not go into the, the gory detail, but the idea is you have some SO6 breaking parameter, but this is the bound. Here are all the generators. These generators generate the SU2 left cross SU2 right. So these are unbroken. Yeah. Electroweak symmetry and custodial symmetry. And the generators that move the VEV, so things which have elements on, on these columns, are goldstones. So these one, two, three, four goldstones are the four components of the Higgs. This goldstone is a gauge singlet. You can see it's a gauge singlet because it's commutes with the SU2 left and right generators. And this could be an interesting mediator. Okay. So we run through this. We identify the mediator, we write down an order parameter for all of this, and the picture ends up being something like this. I have SO6 breaking SO5, SO4 contains the gauged SE2 left, SE2 right contains hypercharge, so things in dashed are, are explicitly gauged. All of this is the usual composite Higgs model building with an extra mediator. So <laughs> this cow diagram is the strong receptor. And I will just put in dark matter by hand, coupling to the strong center. So this blob here is one type of operator, this blob is a different type of operator. These are the gold stones that come out, and gauging gives you couplings of Ws, and the standard model fermions have an entire story of the Higgs, and you just turn the crank. This looks like another arbitrary do whatever the heck you want, but the fact that this is very tightly built on a symmetry structure actually constrains the different ways in which dark matter can couple. And the fact that you do that, there is a finite number of choices for how ordinary matter talks to the strong sector, how much tuning you're willing to accept. And again, you're not solving the hierarchy problem, you're parameterizing how much you're going to live with. You have irreducible interactions from the nonlinear sigma model. And then you pick a, a dark matter embedding. And you make a lot of choices, but they are discrete choices. And then you end up with the mass of the mediator coming out for free. Because the mass of the mediator comes from your symmetry breaking structure. And you really only have two scales, the scale of the, the Higgs and the scale of the symmetry breaking for the sector. So in some sense, it's predictive, and it ties together the, uh, this tuning parameter, so the Higgs VEV, standard model Higgs VEV, versus the symmetry breaking up here. You want that to be order one, it has to be small, uh, to the dark sector. Okay, and this, so, so that's, that is cute, and it pops out of something motivated from this toy vector model. One last thing, which is something not completely different. Um, I put a chalkboard because I was going to draw it on the chalkboard, but I decided not to. This template model, the reason why I know Tim has to do his homework is because he makes a big deal about this, the George Ike Lashon model. And the George Ike Lashon model, um, okay, it's interesting for granification, but one of the reasons why one learns the George Lashow model is because it is a toy theory for monopoles. And in fact, there are papers written about this precise model in the dark sector for monopoles. You get dark monopoles. Right? The fact that you have a VEV, SU2 to U1, you can wind around this thing topologically and produce to polycop monopoles. It was critically important to do that, that the photon is massless. And there's a great paper um, this one uh, about this. I'm not quite sure if I fully agree with all of their conclusions, but they, they, they do some headway estimates and say, oh, you produce monopoles, and there's a way to the hippo Zurich mechanism. The monopoles don't do much because they're completely dark, um, but they're there, subdominant, very subdominant piece of dark matter. It was really critical. But in fact, it's not even that interesting because the, the photons analysis, you could just dualize this theory. Instead of having a photon, have a dual photon, just switch electricity and magnetism, and they look like little topological electrons. If you have a massive photon, as we have laboriously constructed, the whole story changes. Right? Condensed matter people know 
that the Higgs is dual to confinement. If you have a Higgs, if you Higgs the U1, so, so the gauge goes on becomes massive, and you have magnetic monopoles, those monopoles confine. And now something qualitatively different is happening to the theory. And now let me end with this. So, so I'm here today and tomorrow, and, and if anyone wants to talk about this, I would love to talk about this. The lore for kinetic mixing, so once, once you go through the algebra of kinetic mixing, right, visible matter picks up an epsilon charge under the dark photon. So electrons will couple to this dark photon. Dark matter stays dark, so it doesn't pick up a visible charge. You might think the same thing happens for monopoles. The opposite happens. Dark monopoles pick up a very small visible electric charge. But the LHC looks for monopoles, this modal experiment. Here is a motivation for looking for monopoles. And in fact, it had to be this way because if it were the opposite, if visible matter picked up a dark magnetic charge, something like that, then you end up with confinement of electrons. So, um, let me just end with, the fact that you, you are Higgsing the dark photon does something very interesting to objects that you automatically have in your theory. These monopoles confine, and you can end up with these weird theories where you have monopoles connected by some flux tube, and maybe you, have to, you get to play with how tense that flux tube is. So maybe you have quirky dark matter with no non-abelian piece. So because it's not non-abelian, this thing can still couple through kinetic mixing. And depending on how big the strings are, you can either hit your direct detection as a magnetic monopole or some kind of um, dipole. Or maybe you have something even more exotic because you radiate off things by, by water. There is also this thing called the Witten effect. The Witten effect is if you have an FF dual term, this thing which we always say is topological, it's not trivial. It will turn magnetic charges into small electric charges. So now you also have this thing about whether these monopoles are actually purely monopoles or actually dions to visible side. So all this is to say, and this is, this is now work that I'm playing with, with uh, John Kellich, and Mario Montone and Austin, um, there is actually some really interesting field theory coming from this toy model. And the fact that we have a toy model, now you have a simple thing to play with and actually do semi-classical calculations. So, with my remaining 10 <coughs> seconds, um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I am happy to chat about any of this um, over the next day. Oh, no, so, so, so all the crazy stuff happens when, when the dark photon gets a mass. So, so here, the reason why there's an asymmetry between which one gets a charge is because I've given a mass to the dark photon, and that fixes the basis. What has not been studied much, and, and really only recently from um, John Turing and Christopher Harden, has been what happens when there are monopoles on either side, and, and this happens. How does that play with uh, the usual direct quantization? <coughs> Excellent question. Um, there are two answers. One is that a group, had, uh, the Durham group, had done a very careful, tedious check that direct quantization is preserved. So, the answer to their calculation, which I don't fully understand, is that um, this kinetic mixing term doesn't change the current basis for what the charges are. Um, I was bugging Nathaniel Craig about this. For so there's a chosen basis still. Yes, yeah, so it's almost like a rotating basis. Yeah, but then we'll yeah. hope this condition would hold at any basis. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so th that's this is why their explanation was not. I, I didn't. I wasn't happy with it because there should be a clean answer. I mean, how does that limit to the? There is no important basis distinction in the yeah. decimal mass case. Yeah. I'll say morally, the conclusion of the paper is that you do a rotation, so the relevant electric charge that is, is quantized is also rotating with the magnetic charge. Um, but I, I don't have a clean way of understanding this, and this is one of the things I want to better understand. I can mumble words to you that, that Nathaniel Craig had said, that there, there must be a, an appropriate charge lattice that you look at at zero momentum. Right? There's, there's this, um, let me throw up the chart here. Um, this SL2Z, Duality. This is the, the idea that um, 
there's some discrete number of charges that are equivalent in the gauge theory, and, and it must be related to that in some way. But I don't have a, a deep answer that I have. Any other questions? Right, so that will be the, uh, the floor um, zero office until tomorrow.